Alrighty then, welcome back to August Blue Ray Editions, part two. And since this is part two, you should check out the first one before continuing. You don't have to because I don't make any direct references to part one, but it would be cool if you did. And in case you forgot what we talked about on the last one, or you want to know what I talked about on part one, here are all the movies I talked about earlier in the last video. And if you have already seen the last video, on to this one. So starting out our continuation of Blu-ray editions is The Father. Now, this is a movie that's about a man who is suffering from Alzheimer's, but it's entirely told through the perspective of the man with Alzheimer's. And so throughout the movie, we get to see this man played by Anthony Hopkins uh, basically lose his grip on reality. We'll see scenes that repeat themselves, we'll see actors regularly get replaced, and then revert back to the original actor. So regularly, two characters will be played by two different, or no, one character will be played by two actors, and then you'll start to get confused, but then you're realizing this is what this guy sees, and overall, The Father is an absolutely heartbreaking movie. It's it's really well made because of, as I said earlier, uh, acts like replacing actors mid-film, which is a smart move and a good stylistic choice. There are a lot of things like that that kind of give you a sense on what this guy is dealing with mentally, and you start to feel really sad, even though sometimes you start to think Anthony Hopkins' character, the main character, isn't actually the best person, but you still feel really sad. And also... The biggest accomplishment Anthony Hopkins should take away from this movie is that he essentially ruined the Oscars with how good of a performance he gave. Because uh, last year, they the Oscars were planning or making it obvious that they were going to give the award for Best Actor to Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And so throughout the night... They were uh, paying homage to Chadwick Boseman, who unfortunately died earlier that year. Uh, they were talking about Chadwick Boseman, and they even arranged the Oscars so that instead of giving Best Actress Award, Best Actor Award, and then ending the night with Best Picture, as they've done every Oscar, uh, they decided instead to award Best Actress, then Best Picture, and finally Best Actor. So they're getting ready to give the award. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix gets up, gives some apathetic ex speech about blah, 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 honor, blah, 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 Oscars. I think really he's just sad because he isn't up for nomination. Uh, but so uh, Joaquin Phoenix gets opens the award. We're all getting ready for it to get to go to Chadwick Boseman. And then, and the award goes to Anthony Hopkins. And then you're just thinking, wait, what? But Anthony Hopkins was phenomenal in this movie. I think this is uh, one of the best performances I've ever seen from an actor in The Father. So if you haven't seen The Father, go check it out. Uh, next up is The Wolverine. Didn't see it. It's the only X-Men movie I haven't seen other than the new, the new Mutants. And I don't plan on seeing The New Mutants. So I guess I'll see The Wolverine sometimes. Uh, the Help. I haven't seen this either, and that's because you have to be in a certain mindset. Uh, I don't really think often in my mind, if I'm thinking, you know what, I want to watch a two and a half hour movie about racial issues, I'm not going to go watch The Help almost ever, because usually I go and watch Django Unchained. That's what I do. If I want to see one of those movies, I watch Django Unchained, because I love that movie. So, I feel... You need to be in a specific mindset to go watch The Help because no one ever goes, you know what, I think today I'm feeling I'm feeling kind of lazy. I think I'm going to go watch a two and a half hour movie. If you're feeling bored, you're never going to go watch a long movie. Like, like unless you're one of those sociopaths who like regularly rewatches Titanic. But for me... Take a guess what movie I will constantly rewatch whenever I'm bored or just whenever I need to watch a movie. Take a guess. And are you ready? Uh, answer coming in three, two, one. Yeah. So yeah, 
Uh, but yeah, the hell probably gonna watch it sometimes. I don't know. Uh, next up is Tron Legacy. This is, like, I think this was my first, like, favorite movie ever. Or no, maybe it was The Lion King. It was either The Lion King or Tron Legacy. But, uh, I still like Tron Legacy. A lot of people think it's a really bad movie or it's really boring. I don't disagree. Or no, I'm gonna agree to disagree because I don't think it's boring, but... I, I'm not gonna argue it with anyone if they say they don't like it, because it's understandable, is what I'm trying to say. It's understandable if you don't like Tron Legacy. I personally like it, because it has good cinematography, it has good action scenes, the soundtrack by Daft Punk is awesome, and overall, I, I actually liked Tron Legacy a lot. Next up is Pacific Rim. I don't like this movie. I really don't like Pacific Rim. You see... When it comes to giant monster movies, there are two types of ways you can be enjoyable. You can either have a serious dedication to it and make it so you delve into the psychological effects of the monster existing at the moment. Good examples of that would be King Kong and Cloverfield, where rather than seeing the monster try and smash things and just break things, uh, we're seeing... Uh, how the humans react to the monster being there. We're seeing true dread and fear. A good example of that would either be the 1933 King Kong movie or Cloverfield or 10 Cloverfield Lane. Those are those types of movies that I like about giant monsters. On the other hand, you have virtually every Godzilla movie, which is, which is essentially just... Look at this monster, it's gonna smash things, people are gonna yell, Oh my gosh, Godzilla! And then, more things are gonna get smashed, and sometimes the military is involved. Uh, you never really know. But, the problem with Pacific Rim is it tries to be a bit of each, because it tries to show, like, uh, the, um, the psychological damage within our characters that's hindering them from being, uh, from uh, being able to complete their task, but it's also trying to focus a bit too much on the monsters. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm obviously not watching Pacific Rim so I can analyze the inner machinations of our character's mind, uh, because it's a movie about robots fighting monsters, and that's not really something you have high expectations of, but... It seems Pacific Rim didn't acknowledge that everyone was going to see it because they wanted to see robots and monsters fight. No one went to see this movie for any other reason. Like, legit, I didn't even buy Pacific Rim because I thought I would enjoy it, or because I wanted to analyze it. I bought it because someone showed me a Blu-ray of Pacific Rim, and I thought the video quality looked nice, and so I was like, you know, I should check this out for the video quality. I didn't even buy this movie because I thought I would enjoy it. And believe it or not, I didn't enjoy Pacific Rim, which is disappointing because it's directed by Guillermo del Toro, who directed Hellboy and also directed one of my favorite movies, Pan's Labyrinth. But, uh, Pacific Rim, don't watch that. It's, I wouldn't recommend going out of your way to watch Pacific Rim. Like, if you're gonna watch a giant monster movie, watch Cloverfield, 10 Cloverfield Lane, or the original 1933 King Kong movie. Or if you're gonna watch a Guillermo del Toro movie, either watch Pan's Labyrinth or Hellboy. Or the second Hellboy. Uh, they're both pretty good. Uh, so next up is The Muppets. A bit of a change, drastically, from Pacific Rim to The Muppets, but I like The Muppets. It's actually pretty fun. It it kind of reminds me of the Lego movie, how instead of being a kid's movie, it's more of uh, an, an adult's movie that kids will also enjoy, and also vice versa. Like, ultimately, The Muppets is a movie for anyone, because they have a lot of adult jokes in there, and by adult jokes, I don't mean uh, trying to fit uh, innuendos of some sort into your film, because believe it or not, that doesn't work. All that happens is when you try and fit some sort of innuendo into your kid's film, it either makes it so the adults watching it feel uncomfortable... Or it makes it so the kids watching it don't know what you're talking about. The only people who are going to laugh at that are like middle schoolers with the most immature sense of humor ever. 
And that's ultimately the fail, uh, the failure of many uh, modern day kids movies that they think slipping innuendos into their movies is a good idea. But the Muppets adult humor is essentially just making uh, random jokes towards old fashioned ways adults used to operate. Uh, it makes fun of the original Muppets movie from the 1970s. Uh, it makes fun of how annoying uh, annoying dial-up was. Like, you know, dial-up internet where you... I don't know how it works. I wasn't born in the 80s. Uh, but yeah, it makes fun of a lot of those things. And it's just so something that got me chuckling. O overall, I did not expect to enjoy the Muppets that much. But it's actually really good. It's really entertaining. And I'm probably going to go watch it again. Uh, although, the main few problems I have with this movie are that, uh, the ending feels very abrupt. Like, it just feels like they knew they were running out of time, and so they were just like, finish it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. And they even try and, like, add, a uh, a uh, uh, scene that plays during the credits that are actually important to know for the entire story, and that just felt kind of weird and off-putting. But uh, another one last thing I want to say about The Muppets is I like how self-aware it is within its humor. Like, it will make fun of itself and constantly break the fourth wall. Uh, and oftentimes it will acknowledge the fact that they're in a movie and then use that to uh, in enhance the plot. Like, in one part, they literally speed up a process by going into montage, and that speeds up the whole process. Uh, next up is World War Z. Didn't see it. I'm saving it for Halloween. Uh, next up is Man of Steel. Uh, this is a DCEU, DC Extended Universe movie. I used to think it was DC Enigmatic Universe, and now I, uh, I, I look back on when I used to call it that, and every time I want to punch myself in the face. Uh, but it's weird how the DCEU worked, the DC Extended Universe, because sometimes... They'll know what they're doing. Like, the good ones would be stuff like... The good DCEU movies would be like Shazam, uh, Aquaman. I hear the Suicide Squad is good. But then you also have the the other movies that are just not as good. Like, you have Batman vs. Superman, the Sui... Or no, you have Suicide Squad, not The Suicide Squad. And Man of Steel kind of rests in the middle... But I think the DCEU is very interesting because they obviously did not uh, uh, plan ahead for where this storyline was going. Instead, it's more of somebody made a movie and then another guy made a different movie and these two had nothing in common. Because you have these movies where Batman kills people, Wonder Woman is dark and gritty, and Superman doesn't want to save anybody... And then you also have these movies with, like, light-hearted tones to it, like Aquaman or Shazam or The Suicide Squad. And so you kind of reach this clash between uh, stylistic choices that ultimately uh, makes it so the DCEU is a hot mess. And so for that reason, I'm going on a DCEU marathon to watch all of them and just see how long it takes before... Uh, I realize that Marvel actually knows what they're doing more than DC. Uh, so yeah, until then, until I see that, we're gonna move on. Uh, next is True Grit. I love this movie. Uh, I think it's a really fun movie, it's a really well-directed movie, it's well-written, and it's probably one of my favorite remakes. Like, uh, it's- a lot of times remakes feel unnecessary, but not for True Grit. True Grit did a great job at remaking the original, because I've never seen the original. And also, I want to bring something up before I uh, continue. Stop saying that Haley Steinfeld was the best, uh, one of the best supporting actresses ever in this movie. Uh, she wasn't. You know why? Because she was the main character. People keep saying Haley Steinfeld, uh, as a child, as a 14-year-old, was... Uh, a supporting actor in True Grit? She was not. She was the main character. But uh, going on to True Grit, I think it's really funny. Uh, it's really good. The action's awesome. And I love how the Coens kind of inserted that realism they focus on a lot into this movie, where it's very real and very gritty. 
I just love True Grit. I love this resurgence we've had of westerns from the 2010s, like early 2010s. Like, we've had movies like True Grit. We've had uh, Django Unchained. Speaking of which, that's a really good double feature. Like, go watch True Grit and then go watch Django Unchained after because it's really it's really fun to watch. I love both of those movies. I like Django a bit more, but True Grit's still really good. And uh, one last thing, I think Haley Steinfeld in this movie, she was 14 year old years old uh, at the time of shooting True Grit. And I think she's one of the best child performances I've ever seen. Like, my all-time favorite is uh, Natalie Portman in Leon the Professional. But I think second to that is definitely Haley Steinfeld in True Grit. Next up is Skyfall. Uh, not only do I think this is the best 007 movie, but I think this is one of the best action movies ever made. Skyfall is amazing. Uh, virtually everything about this movie is perfect in every way. The action was amazing. The acting was really good, especially from Daniel Craig, who is a really good Bond. Uh, the directing was great. Adele's theme, uh, Adele's theme was really good. I actually listened to it a, a surprising amount of times throughout my day. Uh, and one thing I love the most about Skyfall is the cinematography. The director of photography for Skyfall is Roger Deakins. Now, he also was the cinematographer for movies like 1917, No Country for Old Men, Blade Runner 2049. Uh, I'm not sure what else he did. Uh, I'm sure he, do he did a lot of cinematography, but... I think his work truly shines in Skyfall. This entire movie looks absolutely beautiful. There is no shot in this movie that looks weak or that looks, uh, that is hard to look at. Every shot in Skyfall is amazing, and I love Skyfall so much. I think it is a fantastic movie. Someday I definitely will review it. And just a heads up right now, when I do reveal Sky review Skyfall, take a guess which grade I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it an A+, because Skyfall is a fantastic movie and the best James Bond movie I've seen. Uh, and finally is War for the Planet of the Apes. Now, it's going to seem weird that I just went on a rant about James Bond to this because I haven't seen this, so I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, yeah, definitely a weird transition between the two. But I liked Rise of the Planet of the Apes, I liked Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and I'm sure War for the Planet of the Apes is really good. The only reason I haven't seen it is because I'm waiting on my brother, who, uh, who wants to see it as well. So, Patrick, if you're watching this right now, why haven't you watched War for the Planet of the Apes with me? Alright, finishing us off is Movie of the Month, the segment where I talk about the top 5 best movies out of all of these. So coming in at number 5th place is Speed. I like this movie a lot. I think it's a well-directed and well-written action movie with really good dialogue. At number 4 is Reservoir Dogs. I love this movie. I think it's one of Quentin Tarantino's best. Uh, at 3rd place is The Father. Now, I love this movie, but if it weren't for the other two, this would be at 1st place. It's just that I like these other two almost equally. So... At second place is Skyfall. I love this movie, and I think everyone should see it at least five times within their life, because it is probably the be one of the best action movies I've seen, and definitely the best action movie I've seen all month. And at number one place is, drumroll please, the best movie I've gotten this month of August is True Grit. I love this movie. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a fantastic western and a masterpiece of what it is. It's one of the Coen brothers' best movies, and I think it is the best movie out of all the movies I bought in the month of August 2021. It looks like that just about wraps up August 2021 Blu-ray editions. Thank you for sticking around a longer than usual video. Before you leave, why don't you tell me your favorite movie out of all of the ones I talked about, both in part one and part two? You just saw my favorite, It's True Grit. 
After you tell me about that, you can head on out. Stay safe and watch good movies. Bye!